Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Our Holy Father, in the precious name of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you send your word again this morning as we gather before you. We humble ourselves with obedient hearts. And we will follow your words, O Lord God. We will obey it. May you guide your servant speaker as he delivers your truths of your word today. By your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-18. That, that's our text for this morning. It's Thanksgiving Day. Thanksgiving Sunday, actually. Amen. A Christian farmer spent the day in the city. He went to the city, and then he, for lunch, he went in a restaurant, you know, for, uh, to, to eat his, uh, his lunch. He sat near a group of uh, young people, and then um, sat down, and uh, he was, before he, he took his meal, he said a word of prayer to give thanks for the food. So the young people thought, you know what, this is a chance for me to embarrass this old guy. So he... The, the young man approached the farmer and said, Hey farmer, does everyone do that where you came from? You know? And he was loud enough so that everyone else would hear. The farmer calmly replied, No, son, not everyone. The pigs don't do it. Pigs don't do it. Today is Thanksgiving Sunday, and for the entire Canadian nation, although officially, officially Thanksgiving Day should be celebrated every uh, second Monday of October, it is the annual celebration of harvest and other blessings of the entire year. If you would drive north, we were actually there, there uh, yesterday, I was there with, with Elsa, and we drove north, and you will find, um, you know, these acres and acres of land that they will have a display in that, you know, as you enter their, uh, their parcel of land, they will have displays of bales of hay with their harvest of grain and, um, and uh, pumpkin. And their harvest, part of their harvest, it's on display in front of their yard. That's how they express their Thanksgiving. As historical records show, Thanksgiving in Canada can be tracked, traced back in... Uh, to 1578, there's a voyage done by Martin Frobisher from England, and he did this three times. On the third journey, um, they went to the now present day Nanavut, and as they went there, they were plagued with ice and uh, and uh, freak storm, so that it really was very hard for them to land. And, you know, the fleet of sheep, they were all scattered, but Ultimately, they, they all came to one place where they were about to go, that, none of it, that place. And in that voyage, with that voyage was uh, Maester Wal Walfall, a godly preacher who exhorted them to be thankful to God for their miraculous deliverance from danger. Okay? So that's how it really, is. that's the root of it all. And for many years, it was, it was declared as a national holiday, uh, but not until 1879, Thanksgiving was celebrated either late October or early November. And from 1957 up to now, it was officially declared to be the second Monday of, uh, of October. So the official Thanksgiving will be tomorrow, right? So whether you do it with, with uh, turkey, ham, or however you celebrate your Thanksgiving, even with meager means, you can, you should still celebrate Thanksgiving because we have to express our gratitude towards God. Okay? The question though now is, what are we thankful for? What are we thankful of? You see, the attitude of being grateful starts within your person it has to start from within. When the Apostle Paul said, be thankful in all circumstances, he exactly meant that 
everything, all, in the middle of what is happening to you, whatever the situation is, he said, be thankful. Be thankful. Tell you a story about Corrie Ten Boom. If you know her, Corrie Ten Boom, he, she wrote The Hiding Place. She was uh, imprisoned in this Nazi camp, camp with Betsy, her sister. So they were being moved and transferred. And on this, uh, this uh, particular time that they were being moved to this German camp, the name of that camp was Ravensbrück or Ravensbrück, whatever it's called. And, and as they entered the barracks, they found that it's extremely overcrowded. And not only that, it was filled with uh, fleas. Yeah, I can see your reaction. It was filled with fleas. You know, one bite, I know, one <laughs> bite and you'll be scratching over your body. But the entire camp was filled with fleas. Right? But that morning, before they came to the camp, Corey and Betsy, they were having their devotions and they read 1 Thessalonians 5. And what does it say there? In every and in all circumstances, give thanks. So what did, what did Betsy say? Corey, let's give thanks. In everything and in all details of this camp, let's give thanks. Corey says, including the fleas. No, I won't. I won't. I would not give thanks because of the fleas. Betsy insisted. She kept insisting, no, we have to give thanks in every and all detail that's happening here in the camp. And so ultimately, she came in and she gave thanks, including the fleas, right? You know what? Months came on, months came and went, and they realized they were not being checked by the guards, and they had free access with the Bible, and they were having Bible studies and prayer meetings openly. They were not being checked by the German Nazis. You know why? You know why? Because of the fleas. The guards hated the fleas so much that they do not inspect them. They did not inspect them. So the fleas were actually worthy of being grateful of. Huh? Imagine that. Have you had recently any experience at all that you thought was so bad that you refused to be thankful for? Did you experience anything that you thought you would worry about that you can't be thankful for? What circumstances did you experience in the past week, just this past week, that you think you can't be thankful? Or, to make it to the positive, you were thankful of in spite of that circumstance. Do you remember anything during the week? In this series of verses, 15, 16, I mean, 16, 17, and 18, it is exactly a whole sentence divided into three parts. So let's look at these three parts which will help us into what Paul wants us to be. What is that? Thankful. We have to be thankful. He wants us to be grateful. So verse 16, it says, Be joyful always. Read it with me. One, two, three. Be joyful always. In other translation, it says, Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Always? Really? Every time? How do you get that? It's not uncommon for a person for us to read in the news of a certain rich guy, you know, a celebrity. He had everything that, you know, you think every person would want here on earth. Uh, what I have, but he has it. Fame, fortune, wealth, everything that he has. But then, he did not have joy in his heart. He got so depressed and he did not have any reason to rejoice. He thought there's still something missing. So what did he do? What did he end up doing? It's either he will he gets comfort from drugs, from booze, from alcohol, <coughs> or what's worse, what? Suicide. Because he does not have joy in his heart. Why? 
How can we be joyful always? Being joyful is a state of one's attitude. You can't be joyful if you always complain and find fault at everything and on anything. I found three reasons why we should be joyful. First of all, the church is to rejoice in the salvation brought about by Jesus Christ's faithful life and death and by the power of resurrection even in adversity believers know the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ the very fact that Jesus came into the world for our salvation is enough to bring us immense immeasurable joy that alone Jesus coming here should be enough reason for us to be joyful. Remember what the angel of the Lord said? You know when, when Jesus was born? It's not Christmas yet, but I'm going to remind you what the, angels, what the angels said to the shepherds on the field. What did he say? He said, fear not, I bring you what? Good news of what? Great joy. That will be for all people. That includes us. For unto you, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Christ, the Lord. That's in Luke 2 and 10. Right? Fact alone, the very fact that Jesus came into this world to be born like one of us is good reason enough for us to be joyful. Secondly, being joyful is a byproduct of our salvation. You see, when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Within the gift of the Holy Spirit, among many others, remember Galatians 5.22, what does it say there? Open your Bible, it's one. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, and then what comes next? Joy. Joy. It is part and parcel of the fruit of the Holy Spirit that you receive. Joy is a portion of the fruit of the Spirit and it is imparted to you as a gift of the Holy Ghost. You gotta use it. And not only use it, you have to let it flow from you. Through you and from you. You have to be joyful. Third. Third. You are to be joyful because of your salvation. You have to be joyful because you are saved. Because by faith, you know that you soon will be removed from this earth and taken to a better place to heaven where there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more suffering. Anyone here watched uh, the latest movie? Uh, there. There's one, there's two, you know, there's three, right? Left behind. Yeah, left behind. Left behind. People, millions of people taken. Well, Jesus was just being true to his promise, right? He made good to his promise. So, you know what? I myself, I so long to see that day when I can wake <coughs> up and not feel any pain. You just don't know how hard it is to get up in the morning feeling that, that pain. <laughs> but that day will come soon because it is a reality. You are to be joyful because of it. I am most joyful just longing for that day. You know, just being sure and longing and wanting to have that day soon. I am joyful because of that. King David, in his prayer to God after he sinned, you know, with Bathsheba, he cried, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. There is joy because you are saved. You gotta be joyful. You gotta rejoice. You have to rejoice because you are saved. <coughs> Verse 17. Pray continually. Again, in other translations, it says, Pray without ceasing. You might say, it cost me. That's impossible. How can I not stop praying? 
What if I drive? You want me to close my eyes and pray? You can't do that. How can I stop? How can I not stop praying? That's not what I'm saying. Much like the attitude of always being joyful, praying continually is also a state of one's attitude. You have to be continuous, continuously in the prayer mood. I'd like to reveal to you something uh, about myself. I don't know. Some of you probably may know about this already. But I have a habit when I go to a certain place, especially it's my first time to go there, I will go to a cemetery. I'll find a cemetery and go to that place. Whenever I, I have a chance, I'll, I'll just walk around. If, if I have a car, I'll just drive around the cemetery. Right? Um, it, it's not that I'm looking for a scare, no, no. It's not the scare that I want, it's the, the silence, it's the quiet of the place, it's the quiet of a burial place, and it also reminds me that someday I'm going there, but then someday God will raise me back up and take me back home. That's a promise that I always want to be reminded me of. But then as I am in there, I am always geared into praying, into praying, and, and then, uh, as I move around this cemetery, I always pray. Or sometimes I even just sit by a bench close to a, a tombstone. I don't even know who the tombstone's owner was, but I'll just sit there and pray. I'm not praying for that person. I'm praying for because God <coughs> is really good. And then you know what? Almost always a song will come. And that song is also always a prayer for me. Like this one. I love thee in life. I love thee in death. I praise thee as long as, I, as thou lendest me breath. And say when the death do lies cold on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Beautiful song. Beautiful phrase. Listen to the next verse. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with a glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Beautiful. You may have a song. That song in itself, in and of itself, is prayer. That's prayer to me. But you may have your own favorite song, and you can have that as your prayer as well. Whatever it is, it is a form of prayer to the Lord, and it is praying without ceasing. That's non-stop praying. <coughs> One time I was I was working, I was sorting paperwork, right? And I have this uh, uh, long desk uh, at my table, in my office. And I was, I don't even have earphones, earbuds. But I was sorting paper. And I didn't did realize I was, you know, I had the groove, you know, I was moving. And one of my, one of my uh, office workers came to me and said, what are you doing? Why are you dancing? You know, why are you so, you're so glad? And I said to her, I'm singing. I'm praying. You know, you can do that whenever and whatever, whatever, whatever you're doing. You can keep on praying. That's praying without ceasing. We have to be consistent in our and, and persistent in our prayers. Remember the parable that Jesus taught about the widow seeking for help from this judge who neither feared God or respected men. The widow kept coming to him, asking him to give justice against her adversaries. Ultimately, the judge came in to her request and he said though I neither fear God nor expected men yet because this widow keeps bothering me or pestering me <coughs> I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming now listen to what the Lord said will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him daily day and night Will he delay long over him? 
I tell you, He will give justice to them speedily. See if God will do, if if a person, a judge, who doesn't fear God or respect man, will give in. How much more God when He is a just and good God and He will give justice. He will do it quickly, speedily. My point here is always be in a state of prayer. You see, the magnificent painting of the sunrise every morning as you drive to work, <coughs> what do you do? Pray. Do you see the changing hue colors of fall? What do you do? You pray. Raise a prayer of appreciation to God. And that's only in the morning. Last time you get out of your room, enjoy the warmth, catch the sun, enjoy the warmth of the sun and the cool autumn breeze. What do you do? Thank God for it. Pray. In everything and in all things, pray consistently, continually, without ceasing. Keep on praying. That's what one that's what, what God wants us to do. Verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances. Yes, in all circumstances. In everything. Give thanks. Give thanks to the mundane things around us. You know, mundane things that doesn't... Eh, common things. Have you ever thanked God, you know, common things like when you <coughs> flick a switch in your house as you get home in the night and you flick on the switch and voila, there's light. Have you ever stopped and said, oh God, thank you, I still have power, you know? How about this, the moment you turn on the ignition key of your car or in the case of Brother George, the moment he gets in the car and pushes the start button and it starts. Have you ever stopped and say, thank you, Lord, my car still works? What about this? Now that it's getting cold, did you ever pause and thank God because you got into your home and you have a warm bed to lie into? Did you ever stop and say, God, thank you for the simple things that I have that I'm enjoying? What about this? Have you ever thanked God because as the alarm went off this morning, you wake up and you did wake up and was able to prepare yourself for church this morning. Have you ever done that? And now we're having fellowship with one another. I can, you know, I can go on and on with these simple uh, uh, examples. In fact, I can even, you can even help me out in this. But these common things that we usually take for granted and forget to thank God for, we have to thank God for. Sometimes, Things get so familiar, so common, so obvious that we forget to thank God, to give thanks to God for it. The psalm says we are to give thanks for God's benefits. Think for a moment of the benefits of being here right now. We can laugh and sing and cry. These benefits are part of God's wonderful love for us. Being able to give thanks to God is one of the greatest benefits of being alive. I have even thanked God because I breathe, you know. Think about this. Have you ever thanked God because you have hands to use? There was a great architect who once said, there's been no invention so great like the human hand. Not yet. They have not found any invention as great as the human hand is. It's true. We have to be thankful of our hands. You know what? You have to be thankful of your eyes as well. Thank God because of your eyes. Or you can wait until you're 40 and then you can start, you start seeing things blurry and then you will thank God because once upon a time you can see very clearly. You know? But you have to thank God because of these 
small mundane things. Give thanks. Second, give thanks of the obscure things around us. Obscure, you know, the unfamiliar, unheard of. Things that are not common. Opportunities that are hidden. People that are on the background who, whom you don't realize that they're there helping out. Things that seem useless until we really scrutinize and have a closer look. These things we have to be thankful for as well. Paul wrote, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, think of these things. Stop. Think about it. Ponder. Take a moment to begin to see these things that are hidden to us. When you find these things, give thanks to the Lord because of it. Whatever things of good report, whatever things that are valuable, give thanks for them. It doesn't matter if at first you can see its value. Meditate, ponder, stop and think <coughs> on them and become and it will become more clear. Give thanks of all these obscure things. Little ones, things that are not common. Give thanks. Give thanks of the unpleasant things around us. I already gave you an example. Cory ten boom. Right? But again, you ask seriously? You want me to give thanks of these obnoxious things around me? The objects, objectionable things? You want me to be thankful for them? My boss who's always on my hair, you want me to be thankful of him? Well, the Bible says we be thankful for them. It's hard. You know, yeah, I always give an example for what I feel. If you have a chronic pain, you want to be thankful for that? Well, yes, I am. Because I realize that if God does not allow me to stand, I will not be able to do so. So now I really am thankful. Because right now I'm even here, talking in front of you, able to stand. But it is hard. But if we have an attitude of gratitude, we can change the situation. We are to give thanks in all things, even the unpleasant ones. The question is, how do you give thanks to God when you have this really bad situation? At least, you know what, you can start here. Give thanks for the presence of God in that situation. You have to give thanks because you know that God is with you in that situation. God has not left you and is still willing to redeem you and redeem that situation. Now here's another thing. Listen to this. God is able to make good use of any unpleasant situation that is happening to you. Did you hear that? God is able to make good use of any unpleasant situation that is happening to you. Paul wrote in Romans 8, 28, it says there, Now we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and who have been called according to His purpose. I love NIV translation because it says here, it is God who works for the good. He makes things for the good of those who love Him. He did not leave anything out by chance. Do you know how diversified farming was started? You know how they would plant uh, cotton and then they plant uh, peanuts and then the next year they plant corn? You know, in Enterprise, Alabama, there's a monument in the middle of the town square. It's a statue. You will think it's a statue of a Confederate uh, uh, general. No, it's not. It's a statue of Bo Reveal. It's an animal 
that destroys cotton. Enterprise used to just plant cotton. Year round, every year, just cotton. Yeah? But then this animal destroyed their harvest for that year and they had nothing. The town depended on cotton, but that year they had nothing. In 1915, the bull weevil destroyed their livelihood, but through this, they learned the importance of uh, diversified farming. So now they learned how to play, to plant peanuts and then corn, and then they planted uh, uh, potatoes. You know, and in two years they erected this monument of that animal as a reminder for them that through a terrible event, good things came to the town. So now they're thankful because of what has happened to them. Okay? In the Old Testament, Joseph said to his brothers who sold him into slavery, remember? Joseph, this guy who's got beautiful coat, had 12 brothers, <coughs> no, 11 siblings, 12 of them, he got sold to slavery, Ultimately, he ended up to, uh, to Egypt. And then there was a famine in the land. The brothers went to Egypt and was buying grain for him, from him. Right? And then when he revealed himself, his brothers were so frightened of him. But he said, you meant this to be evil, but God meant it for good. That was his monument to be the power of God to bring good out of apparent evil. See, God uses everything. He can use everything. He can use even the worst in all circumstances. That is to, in this fallen world, and make the best out of it. Whatever bad, however bad you think is the situation, God can make good out of it. You know why we believe that? Because God certainly did not want His Son to die on the cross, but when it became necessary, He despised the instrument of torture of the Roman government and became, that became the way that we can be, we can come to know God by His sacrifice of His Son. Now man can come and approach His throne. The cross became the means by which we can give thanks in all things. Those things that are common, those things that are hidden, and even those things that are unpleasant to us. In everything, we should give thanks. Again, I ask you to join me in prayer. Let's give thanks to God. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you, dear God. First of all, Lord, thank you because you came into this world. You became like one of us, Lord. You humbled yourself and died on the cross, Lord God, became the sacrifice that is needed, Lord, so that we may have life life everlasting.